Hi everyone, how's it going? I'm Malik Bilkadi, I'm an architectural designer and founder of Folly. I have an architecture and design studio here in Los Angeles, and we explore off-grid work, farm master planning, ranch design, residential, private works, uh, hospitality, and we explore these various topics through different architectural applications. And in today's podcast episode, I'm joined here with John Buffini discussing the topic of nomads and how uh, we are inspired by their culture, lifestyle, and resilient structures. Good morning. I'm uh, an expert in human design the last 20 years. I have to say that this is a particularly interesting subject because it's reminding us of freedom. It's reminding us of being in nature. Uh, it's reminding us of an ultimate culture. Malik, for me, I've experienced the nomad lifestyle in Ireland by watching the nomadic and uh, Romani people but you've experienced it in Jordan with uh, Bedouins. Um, let's speak first on Jordanian nomads in terms of Bedouins. What do you know about them? What's the allure for you? Uh, why don't you elaborate on that for us? I mean, I know that the Bedouins, you know, they originated back like 8,000 years ago. And a lot of, they originated in the Middle East. I, I believe it was um, somewhere near... A modern day Iran is where kind of the original nomads uh, started out and Jordan's not that far from there in the Middle East. And I think for me, it was something that was always stitched through our, you know, weekend road trips growing up, going with my family, whether we were going to explore like Wadi Rum or we were doing any sort of like activities over the weekends. Um the, you know, the, the Bedouin tribes and the discussion of the Bedouins and where they were located and uh, things that they were doing and observing them out and about as we were on our hikes or trips uh, throughout Southern Jordan. Um, it was something that always fascinated me. And I always found it so fascinating that, you know, they would set up these very elaborate camps that are, you know, organized around kinship and tribal structures and uh, had a really strong emphasis for like hospitality and kind of passing down uh cultural traditions and things of that nature that was always to me something that was really interesting and they chose to navigate life that way um even though we have like modern day society in jordan there was still this very focused group of people that always caught my attention and i wanted to learn more about them and uh how they navigated everyday life well, similar for me is in Ireland, you know, and I lived in the suburb of Dublin, the Romanies, the gypsies, um, occasionally a horse would break loose and suddenly you'd be running down the street and you had the sense of excitement. You had this sense of other, this sense of uh, people living different lives. And it was just so interesting that their structures, they would set up and in a day they could be gone and gone to a different part of the island. One of the things that I find really attractive in modern day world is nomads expanded, you know, to, they paid attention to the nature, the seasons, the environment, the organic nutrition, hydration of different areas. And they would go in those areas to feed their crop, to feed their, their cattle or their sheep or their horses. And so it wasn't just random like ping pong they would pay attention to their natural surrounds. One of the things I think is really uh, compelling in today's 21st century is the nomads experienced government, agriculture, laws, land. It started to confine them to break the rhythm of uh, traveling. And today we're at a, a new horizon for people wanting to get back to going out to nature, getting out of cities, getting out of towns, having that uh, experience of being in nature. With modern day design, what are your thoughts on both the tradition of creating structures for an environment, moving on to another environment? How are you as a designer incorporating the flexibility, the sensuality, the aesthetic awareness of being in nature. How are you folding that in that you've learned from, you know, Bedouins? Yeah, I mean, I think there's still definitely a good 
uh, amount of people that are holding on to those traditions and are still nomadic and are still, you know, migrating from one area to another and herding animals and navigating life as a, you know, Bedouin within their tribe as modern day society happened and other people, you know, decided to set up a, a more, you know, permanent, permanent location yeah. and, you know, kind of advance in that way. Mm -hmm there was still this fascination of how the Bedouins were navigating uh, this new, my, I would call it almost like animal migration patterns, how they were navigating the different landscapes and uh, the different seasons and still having such kind of a, such a great outlook on all the different parts that were navigating through their hardships and still have like wonderful hospitality. That was kind of one of my experiences with them growing up Um and just how thoughtful everything was and uh, how well planned everything was, even though it seemed like it was just uh, on a moment's notice, which it could be. And I thought that was really fascinating how they can break down their structures and off they go. And these things were, you know, holding up against harsh desert mm. conditions mm. and uh, the way that they were mapped out and passed down from one generation to the next. I always thought that to be quite fascinating and that's why when we were navigating the schematics for our canvas canopies project uh, and working with our tent team uh, and navigating how to kind of pull off the the geometry and the the way that this structural pvc fabric was going to sit um can you expound on the can the canvas canopies so in other words uh, in the Mojave, you can get 70 mile an hour winds, you can get uh, extreme temperatures, you can get there's a harshness there, uh, a beautiful brutality. Can you expand on what, how you came upon creating these canopies that could endure such extremes? I think the, the thought was to pull inspiration from the Bedouins and the origins of Bedouins and their structures and figuring out a way to implement them to meet modern day United States code and specifically in California. Um, that was proven to be quite difficult and still is as you navigate through the different processes um, involved with having an architectural PVC fabric tented over um, an entire structure to become a dwelling. Uh, for people to experience through the medium of hospitality. And I think that for me was super challenging to navigate because we were blurring the lines on so many different elements um, from th something that's supposed to be movable, but it needed to be grounded and in place to be um, deemed safe. And uh, there was a lot of different hurdles to to work through. And I think that the canopies will blur the line between like what a single family dwelling is, what a hotel suite is, and what a Bedouin tenting experience may feel like. Um, now, people can look at an example of your canopies on the website, and they are beautiful. Um, how did you bridge the gap of functionality and form in terms of the way that you have the stitching, the way that it's weighted down, the way that it's angled for aerodynamicness? Can you talk about making a functional structure beautiful what what were your filters in order to make it beautiful yet functional well we needed to first navigate where they were being placed on the property mm. um in the mojave desert mm. um that was one of the first steps and then the second we needed to understand the wind loads and the wind direction um then it, you know we started to think about like okay what is considered outside what is considered inside what are people seeking shelter from and what are some areas that are you can coexist with them being inside and outside mm. um, or be outside, but be sheltered and um, having that program and working through those kind of big filters. And then from there, exploring the idea of symmetry and just something that I'll, I've always found really appealing and how to kind of create this balance in the structure design itself, having them be super low to the ground, having them be, as uh, conservative as possible and almost disappear into the landscape, almost like sand dunes placed on the desert. Um, you see just like the mounds kind of go up and then they fall back down and it's just a blurred line of uh, silhouettes. And so a lot of that was a part of the 
you know, geometric exploration of what we were doing um, in our 3D design, mapping that out with all of the wind load studies and um, how to navigate those different orientations on site to come up with a very appealing design that was functional, but also aesthetically pleasing. It's interesting to me that you've had such a, a dynamic response, like companies in South Africa, in the Middle East, are responding to this because they want that adaptive design for their specific elements. What do you find exciting about taking your design and, and placing it in, you know, South Africa, the Middle East? Uh, what's, what's the excitement for you about creating a design that was designed for the Mojave, but um, is now being attracted to around the world? Well, I think what's appealing about this concept is that we can take it down and package it in a kit of parts and pack it up and ship it somewhere else. Mm. Um, just like the nomads did, you know, and it, there, there's that like nomadic aspect to it uh, of being able to apply it in a different way and then um, adjust the canopies accordingly to meet those specific on-site conditions. So I think there's uh, there's a beauty to that idea of design being able to be applied to different areas and uh, mold itself to that unique environment and that unique context um, without it feeling like you're just copying and pasting. But mm. you're really trying to blur the lines between not having to start over, but creating new, new spaces uh, in different environments with the same principles and design concepts that people were attracted to in the first place. And so I think that to me is really exciting and in, in involving that globally and being able to implement those things in an efficient uh, way. It's important to uh, hear the distinction between glamping and actual architectural aerodynamic design of these uh, canopy structures that you're creating. I mean, I'm looking at a picture right now on your on your website, and it looks incredibly modern. It also has a hint of the ancient, but it also looks rooted to the ground, yet incredibly inviting in because it's designed in such a modern way. Can you make a distinction for us on pic people picturing in their head, glamping, versus uh well, this this has little hvac systems in it the units <laughs> have you know uh, fire sprinklers system <laughs> like it's everything is mapped out as you would um a single family residence yeah. in a traditional mindset but this is all within the confines of a 40 foot module mm. and it services two bedrooms you have a bathroom shower kitchenette and then the living area and dining areas all under this the overarching canopy that mm. covers both structures and it's on this platform and then that's when you start to get you know the open sliders that open out to this platform looking out at the expansive views and it really just kind of starts to blur the lines between this the different spaces you're habitating and utilizing and so i think it starts to set the tone for differences. It's like you're not really walking into a tent, but you're walking under a tented experience. And then you're entering this uh, module that has all of these different uh, modern day human creature comforts. But then you step out onto the other side and then you're back outside again and then you're living out outdoors. So it's different experiences all tied into, into one and trying to bring the old and the new together in, in a new filter, in a new way that's uh, approachable, that could be deconstructed and reconstructed. And as, adapted. And adapted, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's a lot of those different filters. And of course, as we develop the approach to design more and really cover the ground further, I think there's even be more efficiencies that we could really tackle and, you know, take and explore uh, more inspiration from the Bedouin tribe, how they navigate their um, and also to survival a, a more specific word picture too is on the roof of the canopy. You matched the almost the topographical peaks of the the Mojave mountain ranges that they have this double peak. Yeah, um, you put a lot of thought into that. Tell us about you know because a lot of people might be pic picturing like a tent or this. Can you tell us about what uh, the roof means to the canopy. In other words, 
uh, well, how did I think you come the, up with that the, design? The, well, it was being inspired by the site first and the environment mm-hmm. and then uh, picturing those sand dunes I was mentioning earlier and then looking at the sweeping lines and the geometry of the canvas canopy itself and then also having these oculus uh, openings on the top where hot air can be released uh, as skylights would in a traditional home mm. uh, to be able to reduce the hot air under the, the canopy itself. But then the canopy itself also acts as a second skin mm. to the overall structure. structure. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of uh, those types of nuances that people may notice, may not notice as they you know circulate through the space and navigate uh, that experience over a weekend stay and enjoying that with their friends or family or a significant other. I think those those to me are really fascinating moments uh, in grounding the design, but also showing it in like in a new in a new way. Another misnomer is when you think of you know, Bedouin or a Mongolian nomad structure of it being enclosed, you know, for functional practical purposes. Can you talk about the light, the view, because it's, it's not quite there. This is a modern infusion. Can you explain how you use that indoor outdoor uh, feeling and then viewpoints? Because it's not a it's not a enclosed tent, as it were. You know, yeah, it's all about life. it's all it was all about how much we're pulling the tent down to the ground mm. um, and the placements of the the different viewpoints and when does it arch up to highlight a specific moments and then come back down to protect against wind. Um, and almost like think of it like a car windshield. You know, the aerodynamics of a car windshield oh, as you're right. driving it swoops up and up, you know mm. the car and. Um, so just thinking through through that and having it be lower on that end and then raising other points to reveal different views or different experiences and um, highlighting the stars in the sky and utilizing the desert plants around the, the canopies and how you're orient, uh, placing like the orientation of each structure and the viewpoints you're getting from the inside, but also from the outside. And I think that <clears throat> to me was... Uh, really important to almost have it be a revealed experience and you you only get bits and pieces of it from the outside or from a distance uh to almost like would be like almost like a desert mirage just given the fabric mm. and how uh, the color of it and the way that it just blends itself in, within the landscape and then as you get closer and closer and closer you start to see more details and then as you enter the space it starts to reveal itself more so it's this very kind of unassuming approach and then you realize that you're in this massive structure that's covering quite it's a lot of space in height. It's two stories, isn't it, in height? The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh two like about the height of two stories up but in certain points. Um and I think that is quite And then you have really large windows then, right? At the for the viewpoints. Yeah, in the module we have nine foot tall windows, eight mm. feet wide. Um the sliders are about twelve feet wide. Uh, that open out to the deck so you could really have this like indoor outdoor experience uh, it truly is indoor outdoor isn't it yeah and then if you wanted to you know close it up and be inside and it might be a windy day or something then you could do that and still be comfortable and enjoy the views enjoy the views and enjoy the animals outside through the you know through the windows or if it's a beautiful day which most days are um, you're outside and you're enjoying the the tub, stargazing at night or hanging out by the campfire. So it's a it's a really uh, experience based design. Why do you think people like our colleagues in South Africa and the Middle East are are drawn to this? We're talking about the 21st century where you can you know have something 3D printed. What do you think the attraction is for people of having a modern infused? Well, I think people want to get away from the city. People yes. want to get away from. Yes. Uh, the noise and people want to experience something different than a, a traditional build uh, and especially if it's for uh, something like a hospitality stay or somewhere like a, a hotel or a place to sleep I, I think that's a great way for people to explore that most people read about certain topics and certain subjects and they see photos of buildings photos of places photos of people and tribes but they don't really get a sense of that experience firsthand and this is my way of kind of opening a small window, a small portal into what I was inspired by as a child and my origins and my background and navigating life in Jordan and being able to, you know, put that out there as part of my work and explain that origin and be able to introduce people to 
to, to that experience through my filter. You know what I mean? You know, it's interesting for me, you know, I have a beautiful penthouse downtown San Diego, uh, beautiful ocean views, but what I, we have the trains and we have the planes and the airport and it's kind of like you're almost living in Sim City. There's so much going on. And I had the privilege of staying at your Kona estate for a few months. And it was like living in a sound bath where you had the songbirds in the morning and the singing frogs at night, and then the rain falling on these Jurassic like leaves. And it took me about three weeks of being there going, what is that? It's like I have this nagging thing in the back of my head. And I went, Oh, this is peace. This place is peace. And I think from a human design standpoint, I think we've gone all the way to the other side of the pendulum of being in vibrant, dynamic, great restaurants and clubs and nightclubs and of just this condensed living, which is vibrant and exciting. But I think in our culture, we have this desire to experience the opposite of that to refresh us as well. So not only the vibrancy of dense space, but also letting the space speak to us, nature speak to us. Um, was that an important thing for you considering when you were creating these canopies? Like from a sociological standpoint, from a human need standpoint, what did you want this immersive experience to be for people? I wanted people to have the ability to navigate and uh, traverse the vast desert landscape that was around these canopies. Mm. Um, to through hiking, uh, looking up at the stars, uh, looking at the different natural landmarks as their guide, you know, for for that time and that stay that they're staying there. Um, and Bedouins have honed their skills over generations, becoming, mm. you know, experts in the desert navigation techniques. And um, they had their ways of navigating how they're getting around. We have GPS and all of yes. those things, you know, they yeah. just... Um, really followed the sun and uh, the sunrises and the sunsets and the stars. And I think that's just something to me, the, the, the idea of the celestial navigation and the environment um, to take on extensive journeys, whether they did that for months at a time, or I guess that's staying at a space that I designed or worked on uh, is experiencing that for a few days, you know? And I think to me that there's just something uh, very grounding about that experience and utilizing this canopy as a medium for people to be able to experience those things um, and showcasing their adaptability and skills as human beings and grounding them in ways that you don't really get to experience that in the city. Um, and you kind of forget about, um, I think is, 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 is a really beautiful thing. It's interesting to me that I think from a design standpoint, a lot of people have, you know, plots of land, or you've been having people reach out to you about creating a shelter, creating uh, spaces. What do you think the desire for people is to take a pre-existing piece of land that maybe has been their family for a long time, or they bought a plot of land? What are they looking for from you? Well-designed spaces, mm. not massive square footage, mm. really thought out design concepts. Yeah. and getting people i think in today's society and at least the people that i've in, interacted with and have reached out to me really are interested in finding what are the most efficient ways to utilize a space from living dining eating um sleeping and how can we get unique experiences out of those small spaces where you know before there would be kind of like frowned upon to have such a small space more square footage meant um, more luxury, but really it, sometimes just large spaces can be so daunting and so uncomfortable because you just feel like you're either, it, you don't, they don't feel cozy. It's hard to make them feel comfortable and the scale is off. And so I think for me, it's like finding that balance between what the, what those potential clients or clients are looking for in a program and figuring out the, the most unique way possible to have different experiences within the same space while giving them the square footage they need and uh, showing them that there are like new ways to navigate space and how to live in a smaller square footage, 
get the program that they want and they need and be able to do that in different environments or different contexts and different regions and having the outcome be, be, be so unique and different, yet very approachable and usable. Another thing to talk about is from a sustainability standpoint, like I have a friend, they have 17 homes. So you think, oh, they have tremendous freedom. And then I realized the sheer weight of logistical management and they in fact have a team that they've hired to handle these 17 spaces. Can you talk about the spaces that you designed where the door gets locked and nothing needs to be worked on? And um, Well, it's all about looking at the bigger picture. You know, sometimes um, uh, less is more. Yeah. And, uh, and figuring out ways to make things more self-sufficient mm. so it doesn't become a nuisance in the future. And having more things and more stuff means more stress, more headache, mm. um, especially things that are not, you know, attuned to today's society and in, with today's technology. So I always look to the past for um, inspiration and look at the, you know, natural principles of uh, whether it's nomadic tribes or different uh, landscapes and environments. And then today's technology and figuring out how to blur lines between the both and have the experience become this like holistic experience between uh old and new uh through a stay in, in one of my spaces so you fused you fuse the ancient but also the modern so it cuts down on logistics it cuts down on bondage but it also increases freedom and flexibility well yeah that's what modern technology does yes you know you're we're getting efficiency mm. we're not thinking about logistics but then mm. i always look to the to the old because it's clearly become timeless and it's worked for so many years. So mm. why reinvent the wheel when you yeah, could millennia, uh, yeah. pull and research and understand and keep that, keep that alive in a, in a certain way, in a certain light, you're just implementing it in a different filter um, and adding new elements to it to come out with a different uh, outcome. Um, and you're paying homage to something that's existed for thousands of years. Lastly, the, what I want to say on this is, from a sociological standpoint, is the word lifestyle, is that we want to curate a better lifestyle for ourselves, whether we're immersed in the city and our commute and work, but we want the lifestyle that being enveloped in nature um, in a way that is beautiful, but uh, efficiently managed. But I, I think it's interesting that we've, we've kind of come almost full circle we brought our technology and our architecture with us, but we have that desire to hit the reset button on our lives by going to a space that affords that. Um, what's your last thoughts on? on uh... I mean, to me, the, the ideal lifestyle for someone seeking that and uh, really has to be thinking about those key elements of living in a natural setting, um, being surrounded by nature and landscapes mm. um, where it's possible mm. um, and then embracing a sustainable, like an eco-friendly lifestyle mm -hmm. um, and really mm. taking that on in regards to environmentally cautious practices into daily life and figuring out how to uh, work with yourself and your family to either conserve energy, water um, and practicing like, you know, responsible consumption um, figuring out like how to engage in outdoor activities. A lot of the time we're spending so much time indoors that we, again, kind of miss out on a beautiful day out. And I know sometimes we're all working behind a computer with strained eyes. And, mm. um, and that's why I try so hard to kind of pull myself out of the city to, to go on these site visits and reconnect with nature mm. and do it through my filter of work. Um, but I think that, that to me is really important in engaging in outdoor activities and then being able to disconnect from technology and, and setting that aside to, to unplug from screens that we can't get out, you know, get away from now. Yeah. That's, it's yeah. part of daily life yeah. and um, prioritizing health and wellness, you know, mm -hmm. and figuring out um, just being under the sun um, and really Stars, enjoying like yeah. mindfulness and meditation outdoors. I think there's something really beautiful about about that and taking action in regards to conservation efforts and 
contributing to preservation or things that people care about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that really starts to, it's kind of like reading about something, but then taking notes, it just sticks mm -hmm. with you more when you actually take practice and you're actively participating in something. Um, I think that's, you know, really important as well as like seeking knowledge and learning and contributing about your experience to doing the overall good about um, our planet and how we're all navigating it. So, yeah. Well, it's been an interesting discussion. Uh, I just want people to, their takeaway is what is your lifestyle? How are you making that balance between, you know, your high tech uh, urban suburban world? And then how are you moving forward with embracing uh, nature in a smart, responsible way? Uh, it's been a really interesting conversation today. Um, thanks for having me, Mal. Yeah, and thank you all for joining. Make sure to check out the work at uh, www.malakalkadi.com. The project we really highlighted today was Canvas Canopies. Um, if you want to scroll through the imagery and really get a sense of what we were discussing uh, to better follow along. Thank you so much.